This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Friday, June 19th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of coronavirus, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Kenya was elected to the UN Security Council on Thursday, defeating Djibouti in a second round of voting by the 193-member General Assembly. An initial ballot had failed to produce a clear winner. Mexico, India, Ireland, Norway, who were elected on Wednesday, and Kenya will take up their two-year terms on the 15-member council on January 1st, 2021. Mexico and India were elected and opposed, while Ireland and Norway beat Canada. To ensure geographical representation, seats are allocated to regional groups. All candidates need to win the support of more than two-thirds of the General Assembly to be elected. Neither Kenya nor Djibouti achieved that during the first round of voting. The Security Council is the only UN body that can make legally binding decisions like imposing sanctions and authorizing the use of force. It has five permanent veto-wielding members, the United States, Britain, France, China, and Russia. Zambian police have detained award-winning photographer Chela Tukuta for criminal libel. Authorities say Tukuta posted on social media disparaging comments about information and broadcasting minister Dora Silia, Zambia Revenue Authority Commissioner Kinsley Chanda, Northern Province Permanent Secretary Charles Sipanje, and former presidential spokesperson Amos Chanda. Chanda says the allegations by Tukuta is causing so much discontent among certain sections of the Zambian society that some people have been mobilizing to attack the photographer. Malawi's High Court Thursday summoned four Malawi Electoral Commission members to explain to the court their appointment. The main opposition, Malawi Congress Party, had petitioned the court to clarify the appointment of the four. MCP National Publicity Secretary Maurice Montali says the four are from the ruling Democratic Progressive Party, when in fact each major party was supposed to have two commissioners. He also says President Peter Mutarika reappointed two other commissioners from the previous elections commission that the courts declared incompetent because of the way it handled the 2019 presidential election which results were nullified in February this year because of irregularities. June 19th or Juneteenth is observed by many Americans as the day in 1865 the last slaves in America were told that the Civil War had ended and they were now free. But this year strikes and protests may accompany barbecues and celebrations amid a national uprising to demand racial justice. Isha Sarai and Jesusa Ani have more. Juneteenth, also called Freedom Day, marks the day that the last slaves in America were told they were free two years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in the midst of the Civil War, ending 246 years of slavery in the United States. On June 19, 1865, General Gordon Granger, who was a Union Army general, who was responsible for the district, uh, the Emancipation District, including Texas, uh, landed in Galveston, Texas, Galveston Bay, and read a proclamation declaring that from that moment, enslaved Africans uh, were free. Juneteenth is a state or ceremonial holiday in 47 states and the District of Columbia. In past years, the holiday has been observed as a time to reflect on the legacy of slavery and the history of African Americans, a summer tradition with music and parades. It's a coming together on this day and the elders in the family pass on stories to the young and they pass on our family histories, uh, history of of our uh, of African Americans, uh, just sort of the legacy of 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 the African American experience through through family story. But this year, protests against police brutality, specifically against African Americans, have put race relations at the forefront of many discussions across the country. 
Strikes and continued protests are expected around the country on June 19th, many of them calling for action, including defunding police departments and reinvesting that money in community building and education. I think it's a national call to action. I think everyone's trying to organize in some capacity. I think the tension right now is trying to balance it between being a celebration, right, and a demonstration, right, like how to give space for Black joy as well as a form of resistance. For Jordan and other activists, Juneteenth is a reminder of how much still needs to be done in the fight for racial justice. When I look at the history, right, of the fact that it's two and a half years later, right, after the Emancipation Proclamation was passed, that to me is a testament to how justice and freedom even work in this country, right? Like, it took two and a half years for the last person to find out that they were only technically freed right, because they weren't substantively or in practice. This year, as conversations about racial inequality and police abuse continue nationally and locally, a number of American corporations, including Google, Target, Nike, Twitter, and Square, have declared Juneteenth a company holiday. Millions of people taken from one continent to another and forced to build basically the modern world system. You can't repair that completely. But what you can do is not only acknowledge it, but try to create a society where the descendants of those people are restored. And activists plan to use the holiday to continue to push for creating such a society. Isha Sarai, VOA News, Washington. For more on Juneteenth and the 1921 Tulsa massacre, an event that's among the worst incidents of racial violence in American history, when mobs of white residents attacked black residents and businesses of the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma. VO International Edition host Steve Miller spoke with Dr. Scott Ellsworth, a professor in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies at the University of Michigan, about the two events. The Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921 was the single largest incident of racial violence in American history. It happened during a very perilous time for African Americans, an era of lynching, of the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan, which was the largest terrorist organization in American history. But there were some events that happened in Tulsa. There was an incident in an elevator between an African American male teenager and a, uh, a white American uh, elevator operator. We don't know what happened actually in the, the uh, elevator, but the next day, one of Tulsa's afternoon newspapers, the Tulsa Tribune, did a uh, published an inflammatory article saying it was an interracial rape attempt. And they also published an editorial entitled Two Lynch Negro Tonight. And within a half an hour of that paper coming out, a lynch mob started to gather downtown at the Tulsa courthouse. The mob grew over the hours, 200, 300, 500, 1,000. Then around 1030 at night, a group of African-American World War I veterans, uh, all armed, went down to the courthouse, presented themselves to the sheriff, said, we're here to help defend the prisoner. They were turned away, but as they went, an elderly white man tried to disarm one of the black vets. A shot was fired, and uh, the race massacre began. Now, as I understand it, ultimately, the National Guard was called in around the, the 1st of June to kind of put things to rest. Is, is that correct? That's correct. The, uh, the, the state troops, the National Guard troops from Oklahoma City were called in, but there were local units of the National Guard who were involved early. But by the time the state troops had arrived, uh, Tulsa's black community known as Greenwood had already been largely destroyed. Uh, a mob of whites, we don't know how big, maybe 5,000 invaded uh, the black neighborhoods, looting and burning uh, more than 1,000 homes and businesses to the ground. In a statement to VOA, the Oklahoma National Guard called the events in 1921 nothing short of horrific. And while there are widely varying accounts of the role played by the National Guard during the rioting, the truth of the matter is that many of Tulsa's white citizens committed atrocious acts against their neighbors and guardsmen. However, the historical record shows that a handful of brave guardsmen protected the Tulsa armory and the weapons inside from more than 300 white rioters. The actions of these guardsmen substantially reduced the number of murders in the Greenwood District. And in the days following the riots, 
Oklahoma Guardsmen restored the order to the area and prevented further attacks by both black and white Tulsans. So that was 1921. This is 2020. It's 99, just over 99 years after the race riot in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 150 plus years after the Emancipation Proclamation was, was issued. And this is coming at a time where we have worldwide protests addressing inequality and systemic racism. So I guess the question I have for you is a very difficult one. Why are we still having these kinds of conversations, you know, so many years after the fact? Well, I think one reason is, I mean, there's a couple reasons. One reason is, is that much of our history has been suppressed. Um, there are certain versions of American history that school children learn, and oftentimes some of the more darker spots are are wiped away and people don't know about them. So that's been a process. The the right race massacre was actively suppressed for decades. It's been a long process to get that story out. The other is, is that, you know, American society is far from perfect, but there's been a lot of change. Certainly been great changes in my lifetime. So as people start to learn more and get a more accurate and fuller picture of our nation's past, I think people are starting to question what it is that we as a nation should do today. So is, is education the primary way to address this? I think it's a very important way to address it, but I also think we have a, a larger problem, which is America is a nation that is obsessed by race. Americans think about race when they leave their, when they go out the front door, what neighborhood they're going to, when they walk into a room, and we talk about it, but the problem is it's we tend to talk about it only with people who look like us. And we are still a segregated society by school districts, by churches, by neighborhoods. What we need to do is to start having honest, face-to-face -face conversations about race with people who don't look like us, to be able to listen, to understand their perspective, not to be accusatory. And I think once we have a better idea as to where we've been and where we're at, we'll have a better plan for where we should go in the future. Dr. Scott Ellsworth worked with the lead scholars for the Tulsa Race Riot Commission and has been involved with ongoing efforts to secure compensation for the survivors. He was speaking to VOA International Edition host Steve Miller. Saturday, June 20th marks the 19th observance of World Refugee Day. The annual celebration champions the accomplishments of refugees while raising awareness and rallying financial support. VOA's Arash Basadi reports that this year highlights challenging during the era of COVID-19 and the contributions refugees make on the front lines and beyond. Syrian refugee Mohammed al-Khalaf fled his war-torn country for a chance at a new life in Germany. Far from the bombs and bloodshed, he followed his dream of becoming a rail operator. I'm someone always trying to do his job well and grow. Al-Khalaf is one of the millions of displaced people the United Nations recognizes on World Refugee Day. We basically use it as an opportunity to not only highlight the plight of refugees and the need for international protection and international support for refugees, but also all the diversity and contributions that they offer to the, to the world all the time. Chon Agadini Williams heads the communications desk for UNHCR, the United Nations Refugee Program. She says the coronavirus adds yet another challenge for already struggling refugees. There are some places where, because of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, that there's less presence of international organizations. Those places include Yemen, where this week violence surged after a coronavirus-inspired ceasefire expired. Around 80 percent of the country's war-torn population relies on humanitarian assistance, pushing aid programs to the breaking point. UN spokesman Chris Boyan. By and large, we are still in a situation where the, the means and the resources that humanitarians in general, UNHCR in particular, uh, possesses today to respond and to help governments and all peoples respond to the real challenges at hand still remain short. War and violence caused many of the world's nearly 71 million refugees to flee. Addressing their needs requires large-scale international mobilizations, according to Boyan. 
And that's why UNHCR is working with the government of the United States and with governments around the world to find adequate solutions, solutions that are both up to the challenges at hand and are put into action in a way that is sustainable for a long time to come. Giving refugees like Al Khalaf a chance at a war-free life. I could not think about my future. Now I have this traineeship with a guaranteed job at the end. Now I can think about my future again. I have hope again. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News, Washington. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, Kenyan musician Makadam releases the single Plandemic, a new kind of electronic dance music that serves a surprising double purpose. Stay with us. Hello, I'm Lynn Ormudu, your VOA health correspondent. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization says do not, under any circumstance, spray or introduce bleach or any other disinfectant into your body. These substances can be poisonous if ingested and cause irritation and damage to your skin and eyes. Bleach and disinfectant should be used carefully to disinfect surfaces only. For more information on COVID-19, visit who.int or contact your local or national health authorities. Welcome back to Africa 54. A United Nations report reveals that more and more children are victims of hate, bullying and violence due to the coronavirus pandemic. Many children are without access to support networks such as educators, friends, and extended families they usually find at school, and some children are stranded in abusive homes with no place to turn for help as schools are locked down to control the spread of COVID-19. Nearly 1 billion children are suffering from physical, sexual, or psychological abuse each year, especially in places where governments failed to set up support programs and COVID-19 isolation is making the situation worse, according to the report. World Health Organization Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus says there's never any excuse for violence against children. World-renowned guitarist Steve Masakowski didn't want to push his children into music. Both kids, including daughter Sasha, embraced jazz anyway. The children are now adults, and the New Orleans family continues to bond over its shared passion something they will celebrate Sunday on Father's Day. I'm Steve Mazakowski and I'm a jazz guitar player, uh, composer, educator from New Orleans, Louisiana. Well, our household was full of music uh, for sure. My wife is a, a classically trained pianist and uh, we actually met um, when she was going to Loyola uh, University and she was studying music there. And uh, I had been playing at a jazz club called Tyler's at the time, playing with Ellis Marcellus. My name is Sasha Mazakowski. I am a, a singer, jazz musician uh, here in New Orleans, Louisiana. So my earliest memories would be watching my father perform at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival with his band, The Ashville Project. He's played with everybody. He's so well-versed, and he's, you know, renowned all over the world because of that. I didn't, I didn't really want to push my kids into music, and my wife either. Um, I wanted them to experience the joy of music without being pressured into it, and I think that's what happened. I think what I love about jazz is the freedom that you have to really find your own voice. Playing music together with my dad, he used to sit me down at the piano when I was a little girl and, and teach me ear training and, and, and try to teach me how to improvise oh, while he played guitar. <laughs> how old were you there? I don't know. Probably about one. Uh -huh. 
I think I was like a freshman in high school and there was a boy who was like a junior or senior and I had a crush on him. I thought he looked like Justin Timberlake. I remember he came up to me and he, he grabbed my hands and he said, oh my gosh, you have your dad's hands because he was this total music nerd and I was like, oh, my dad's actually kind of cool and like, you know, I can, I can use this to my advantage. I mean, one of the most memorable things for me was uh, our first gig that we ever did. Do you remember where it was? It was like at that like restaurant or something. We play together and sometimes we tour together, we'll go to Europe and it's a wonderful experience to be able to play with your kids. Working with my dad is, I mean, he's, he's very, He's like the boss, you know, and, and so, and sometimes he makes that known before rehearsing something and, you know, I'm on my cell phone, whatever, checking a text message or something, and I mean, he'll snap at me, what are you doing, get off your phone, you know. <laughs> She's a really great composer and a lyricist, a really great lyricist. In fact, I asked her uh, to write, you know, lyrics to some of my compositions, and she always comes up with just brilliant lyrics. And then also the fact that she's a great solo artist. I think I want my dad to know that I'm just so, so, so deeply grateful for him in my life, both as a musician that I can play with, a mentor. Fresh market coffee and chicory. Mm -hmm. But also just as a father. I mean, he's, he's one of the most kind and generous, loving people I've ever known, you know, and totally selfless. And, and uh, I think he's taught me a lot about, about what it means to have, like, just a really strong person in your life who was there for you no matter what. So how did you do this? Yeah, I mean, it was a crazy process. Right, what's my dad like as a person? He is super duper 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 smart and, like, can do anything himself. I already put the water in. Because <laughs> he can just fix my car, you know, or do anything in the house, the plumbing, the electricity. I, Father's Day is, I guess it's special to me now because when I see my kids uh, uh, grown and pursuing their own careers, it's, it's, it's really amazing. It makes me very, very proud. Um, I think like I say, we all have our own separate careers, but we get together, you know, as a family, and we tend to we tend to we tend to find common ground in New Orleans music or original compositions and things like that. <laughs> in our entertainment segment, Kenyan musician Makadem dropped his new single and its visual pandemic on June fourteenth. He calls it Nyatiti Trap, as in trap music. Host of VOA's Music Time in Africa radio show, Heather Maxwell, catches up with the artist to discover how his catchy dance song about coronavirus also trailblazes the revival of a nearly forgotten traditional instrument. Heather reaches Macadam in Copenhagen, Denmark, where he has been since March when COVID-19 travel restrictions cut him in the middle of a European tour. Hi, Macadam. It's nice to see you. I see you too. It's a long time. It has been since 2015 in Nairobi. And now you are in Denmark and just put out this great music video. Tell me about what you mean. Uh, this is a pandemic, and in fact, it's all academic. These people said this is God's plan. Like if an accident happens, if one dies, if you're poorer than others, if whatever happens is God's plan. It's a pandemic. Humans also believe if you do something, it's a plan. What is it? The pandemic. Just I'm look, I'm saying this is.
just say, I really do adore the sound. I mean, actually, the reason I chose this song to, to present for all of our viewers and radio listeners around the world is because of the sound. It's really unique, it's catchy, it's trapped with this amazing traditional instrument called the Nyatiti. Do you think this is the first, Nyatiti and trap? Another point why I'm doing such things, uh, using Nyatiti in the electric dance music, and also now going towards hip hop and R&B. I even have an R&B piece that I'm here to record. It's kind of trapped with the old musicians who are not really making money with it outside, apart from performing for the government or in the museum or in cultural centers or in funerals or in weddings, but deep in the rural. So it's not really a commercial thing for them. So I find myself as an island. And and being a loudmouth, I decided, okay, let me do things that probably might make more artists who are using it to go out there and do something about it. So you're trailblazing a path for younger artists to rejuvenate yeah. and reinvent the Nyatiti in a relevant form for today. For now, yeah. For now. It's for, great. It's, it's I, what I call new music politics. Not pandemic. <laughs> Well, thanks so much. I love the music video. I love the sound. Um, thank, thank you. you for being with us here on Music Time in Africa and Africa 54. Bye. Bye. Join Heather Maxwell every Friday for our entertainment segment. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend.